everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Abdul El Sayed, and this semester I uh, have the privilege of serving as a Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Welcome to this policy talk at the Ford School event with uh, Andy Slavitt. Shortly, we'll be discussing the state of healthcare in the United States, as well as uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, in that context. And I'll, I'll say more about Andy uh, and our topic in a moment. Uh, this event is part of the Towsley Foundation lecture series, and I want to thank the Towsley Foundation for their support. Before we get started, a quick note about format. We'll have some time toward the end for questions from the audience. We've received some questions in advance from the registrants, and uh, you can also submit questions on the live chat function on YouTube or tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. Now, on to our discussion. Andy Slavitt is our guest for the day. He was President Biden's White House Senior Advisor for the COVID response. He's led many of the nation's most important health care initiatives, serving as President Obama's head of Medicare and Medicaid services and overseeing the turnaround implementation in defense of the Affordable Care Act. Andy Slavitt is the outsider's insider, serving in leading private and nonprofit roles in addition to his government services. He is founder and board chair emeritus of United States of Care, a national nonprofit health advocacy organization, as well as a founding partner of Town Hall Ventures, a healthcare firm that invests in underrepresented communities. He co-chaired a national initiative on the future of healthcare at the Bipartisan Policy Center. He chronicles what goes on inside the government and across the na nation at town halls in USA Today, on his award-winning podcast in the bubble, and on Twitter. He's the author of Preventable, a best-selling account of the U.S.'s coronavirus response released in 2021. He's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard Business School, and he and his wife have two grown sons. Andy, welcome uh, to the Policy Talk. I look forward to, uh, to continuing conversation, actually, we had on uh, my podcast, and um, I've, I've had a lot to learn, and I know that uh, all of us have a lot to learn from both your service and your experiences. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the nice introduction. Of course. Well, look, I, I want to just jump right in. We're in this unique moment. Uh, just to set the stage from where we are, and we can work backward, uh, what is your perception right now about the state of the pandemic? Mind you, you're talking to an audience mainly in Michigan, where uh, we learned as of two days ago that we are the uh, unfortunate uh, pandemic capital of the country yet again. Um, but what is your perception of the state of the pandemic? What uh, are the key hinge points that we should be thinking about? Probably neck and neck with Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> look, I think, um, you know, I know this pandemic feels a bit like Groundhog's Day uh, to everybody. And I think one way to look at it is, gee, when will we ever move on? I think there's another way to look at it, which is which with each cycle, we get uh, what, what principally changes is we have a better and better set of tools. Um, to manage the pandemic, keep ourselves safe, and return to more and more of our pre-pandemic existence. So for a lot of people, that means vaccines. It means booster shots. It means, uh, but it also means things like indoor uh, air quality and uh, portable filtration systems. It means things like monoclonal antibodies. Soon it will mean uh, the uh, antivirals that, that are coming on the market. It, it also means rapid antigen tests. And so, you know, I think if there are passions in our lives, uh, whether it's, you know, going to a Detroit Lions game, although I find that very hard to believe. <laughs> One um, can't really be passionate about that, to be fair. Yeah, but, yeah. but maybe a Michigan uh, game. Uh, <laughs> or go. seeing your family over Thanksgiving or the, ho the uh, winter holidays or... Um, uh, whatever it is, um, those things are increasingly possible if we make use of this these tools um, that are available to us. So um, I would encourage us to, to think seriously about the fact that, yes, we have people still at risk. Yes, there are risks in our community. Um, yes, when those risks get too high, they, they make our hospitals and our healthcare system work harder than they can. But I would also uh, urge people to think about the fact that we do have these tools. And with these tools, um, we are able to um, stay safe in many and most settings. And even if we're not staying 100% safe, um, we, are, we are making things much, much less risky. And none of these tools is perfect, including the vaccine. Uh, but all of them together um, are a pretty great combination and represent an advance of where we were a year ago or even the last time that Michigan was, uh, was facing high case counts. So would you agree that, you know, the, the statement that a case in 2021 isn't quite the same as a case in 2020, that the increasing uh, number of cases doesn't necessarily represent that we are back to where we were or back to square one, but rather 
maybe is a average function that is driven by the exceedingly high risk among people who have yet to take up uh, vaccines. I think that's right. Look, I think I think the difference today is we have um, you have an option. Now, it is true that that there is a good portion of the public that is choosing not to take advantage of that option. Um, but by and large, by and large, um, they are endangering themselves more than they're endangering you if you are taking uh, even simple and basic precautions. Somebody did some math uh, for me, which I found interesting, which is what's the likelihood that if, you, if you're vaccinated, if you have a guest over for Thanksgiving and they're unvaccinated, um, what's the danger to you? Because I think a lot of us are used to um, thinking about that as something that we really have to avoid at all costs. Now, it's interesting, the math that someone did for me showed that, you know, if you drive 50 miles or more over the holidays, um, which a lot of people do to, to visit family, the, the rate of highway fatalities is about one per 100,000. So you've got to, you get on the road, you got a one per 100,000 chance uh, of, of, of being a fatality. Now, for most people, that doesn't stop us from hitting the road. We kind of understand that risk. If, if you are going to a holiday gathering uh, and your chances of getting, of coming in contact with someone who is uh, going to infect you and you dying uh, is about one in 100,000 if you're unvaccinated. Uh, if you're vaccinated, it's about a sixth of that. It's it's about a sixth of one in 100,000. So um, we're talking about, uh, if you're vaccinated, extremely low risks, risks that are, um, you take greater risks all the time. And so if, for example, you asked your, your, your uh, aunt or un uncle who weren't vaccinated to take a rapid antigen test um, or take some other kinds of precautions, we're talking about um, being uh, able to really reunite with family members um, and um, begin to put some of the things that are important in our lives back. Um, and I think that's a real change. And hopefully, you know, we feel, and I feel a sense of, of gratitude to be able to have some of these people, you know, back in our lives again. Yeah, I appreciate that context. That's a really helpful way to put it. So in order to have the same risk at Thanksgiving, uh, if you're vaccinated, vis-a-vis uh, -vis interactions with an unvaccinated person, you would basically have to drive for 300 miles. Um, and that would be the same risk uh, in the way there as, as the risk that you're taking of COVID at the actual gathering. And that's a really helpful way of thinking about it because you're right. I mean, we do a lot of things to protect ourselves from the risk of automobiles, but we tolerate that risk. I want to step back um, and, and, and think a little bit about the genesis of the pandemic, something you've written a lot about in your book, Preventable. It is, of course, a complex thing, a pandemic. Uh, it's not just a virus, but it's the context within which a virus um, makes, uh, makes its landfall into humanity. How did America's circumstances prior to the pandemic shape the outcome of the pandemic that we ultimately experienced? Uh, that's a really well-phrased question. You know, I think, I think there were a few things about the country that, in retrospect, really were pretty determinative of, of the outcome here. One, uh, for example, is we simply had no prior experience with pandemics. Countries that did, um, Hong Kong, um, uh, places in East Asia, um, had a very different reaction and much, much uh, lower death count. Uh, number two, uh, we had a healthcare system and an employment system uh, here where only certain people had access to healthcare, something you talk quite a bit about, Abdul. Um, and that meant very unequal um, access to care. You know, we have a country that has people with more pre-existing conditions, but we also have a, a system that is different. If you are if you work by the hour, are a person of color, um, have lower income, you know, come from generations of poverty, than if you get paid a salary and can work from home. Um, and so those two experiences were quite different. And um, it didn't lend itself to the level of empathy uh, for people who felt relatively safe during the pandemic. Uh, for, for many communities that have been relatively unsafe and still are. Um, even yesterday, someone said to me on Twitter, um, you don't get it. Most of us don't know people that have died of COVID. And my response is, yes, you do. You know plenty of people who died of COVID. They're the people that grow your food. They're the people that 
drive your food to the distribution center. There's the people that work in the meatpacking plants. There's the people that work in the grocery store. You may not know their name, but they're a big part of your life, and you wouldn't be eating without them. So uh, we don't see this anymore. It becomes much less visible, and that's one of the other things. Another factor, you know, we've spent the last few decades um, uh, really diminishing the role of experts, expertise, and institutions, I should, at least in, in, some, in some form. You know, we, we know there's a good quarter of the public now that uh, doesn't believe in um, experts and expertise and science um, and have had a hard time um, crossing the chasm of being able to um, really um, relate to and get on board to the kind of solutions and the kind of tools that have been available in this pandemic. Um, so, you know, those are, those are underlying societal issues. Our healthcare system, kind of our view of science and expertise, um, the, the very uh, unequal nature of the country, our lack of experience with pandemics. And, you know, therefore, because of all that, we rely on our technical expertise and our wealth to try to stop the pandemic before it happens. So there's all kinds of criticism of the CDC and of things we did wrong and so forth, because we in this country don't expect to be protected um, we, we expect, I should say, to be protected, unlike the, most of the rest of the world, which feels like part of what they have to do is come together as a society and prevent these bad things from happening. Here, once you, once you penetrate the walls, once, once the virus started spreading, and we have a very rapidly spreading respiratory virus, and it comes to counting on one another to keep each other safe, um, that's where we perform very poorly. I really appreciated your framing uh, of the answer around a couple of really key specific polls. One is profound in inequity uh, in our society by uh, race and in, in, in socioeconomic position, uh, and also by geography. And that inequity uh, really does explain so much of the differential in, in lost lives and livelihoods. But, but another piece of the framing that you offered was uh, around collectivism. Um, and uh, you, you pointed to the role of the healthcare system. And in some respects, you know, when you look at our society and our healthcare system, something that you, you've done a lot of work on and I've done a lot of thinking about, um, our healthcare system, you know, really is the, the, the sort of tip of the iceberg when it comes to our failure to invest collectively in people. We have a deeply fractured system, but also a deeply unequal system. Even if you are covered on Medicaid, the reimbursements for your care are substantially lower than they would be if you had private health insurance. And I uh, wonder, you know, two questions here. What was the role of the structure of our healthcare system specifically? Um, in explaining the, the kind of outcome we had. But then secondarily, you know, where, where do you think we should go from here? What, what, what should the debate look like um, following a, a pandemic of this magnitude? And you know, have we learned any lessons that may reshape our healthcare system? Or do you feel like uh, we are just entrenched in what we have? Well, in the community where I live, um, I can get my way to a hospital if I need to. I can get my way to one of a number of urgent care centers. There's plenty of specialists here where I live in California. Um, and uh, I, I have means to get there. I have means to pay for that care. I have insurance that covers most of it. And um, likewise, uh, the kids around here, most of them have internet in their homes. So if they're, if they're missing school, they, they, uh, they can still study. Um, they have access to enough food in their refrigerator. And so, you know, we have this, many of us have this kind of safety net in life that we're so fortunate to have. And if you look at the scope of history, the scope of human history, most people on this planet don't have that level of safety net. And indeed in this country today, um, a large number of people live without that level of support and safety net um, with them. And, and that happened before the pandemic, as you point out, Abdul. It wasn't um, something that just started happening with the pandemic, uh, but Kids, need, you know, we, we learned a lot during the pandemic about how many kids needed to go to school just to get, just to eat. How many kids sat inside parking lots, outside of liquor stores, just to get access to some Wi-Fi so they could, they could do some work when they couldn't go to school. Indeed, in the healthcare system, how many people just don't routinely even have a place to get their blood pressure checked um, to uh, deal with an addiction problem, to deal with a mental health problem? Um, and we've systematically underinvested in the resources that exist throughout the country. Um, there was this um, narrative that we were asked to believe since early 1980s, since, since the days of Ronald Reagan, 
which went something like this. The greatest threat to our country is if we get a big, de- such a big deficit uh, that we, we, we will, that it'll bankrupt us. That is our biggest threat. And so we spent decades neglecting to invest in public health, in mental health resources, in safety nets, in child care, in early childhood education. And guess what? Not only have been people have been suffering along the way, but it turns out that that lack of investment was a bigger threat to us. Uh, lack of investment in public health, lack of investment in things that we can't see, but which societies do invest in, particularly wealthy societies. And we didn't. So the question you're asking, I think, is the appropriate one, which is, will we have learned our lesson here? And what can we do? I'll tell you that um, if... I think that if people ask me the number one most important thing to do out of the pandemic, I'd say making that child tax credit that that just uh, was in one of the earlier recovery acts, making that permanent. Um, Because um, uh, oddly enough, uh, if we don't fix that problem, then I have very little hope that we're going to fix bigger problems out in the future. That one was thrust right in front of us, right in front of our face. And if we can't make a decision that we know will take half the kids in this country and move them out of poverty into a situation of at least some breathing room, then then we don't have the guts to make any decision that doesn't just benefit us and ourselves. And we can return to this narrative that says that we have uh, we have to fear uh, is you know too high taxes or or some uh, some you know deficit or debt or something like that. Um, and indeed, you know, good management suggests that all of those things are important considerations. Uh, but we have in the last 40 plus years really robbed ourselves of the ability to have, um, any level of comfort or cushion in the case where things like this happen. And people face this every day, people who don't live in my community, but live in a community that's seven, eight miles away from here can't find the very things uh, that I'm talking about very easily. And they live 10 years shorter of a lifespan. And that happens all throughout the country. And all of you who are part of the School of Public Health Policy understand that very well. I want to I want to zoom in on the healthcare system, uh, because I, I do think that, you know, when you look at the crux of the system of inequity that you, you're talking about, um, the, the choice not to guarantee every person in our society basic health care, I think, sits at the core of that. 67% of, of bankruptcies in this country are attributable to healthcare. Part of that is, you know, folks who are even insured in the first place, given the fact that insurance product today is not the same thing as it used to be, more deductibles, more out-of-pocket uh, in the form of co-pays and co-insurances, higher uh, out-of-pocket limits. And um, in, in some respects, you know, you, you go before the pandemic, in the bad old days, um, before the pandemic, healthcare was the number one issue. And it's interesting, right? Because in so many ways, that conversation tends to be dominated by uh, talking points from corporations who make a lot of money off of the system as it stands. And so, you know, part of public provision isn't just the public policy choices being made in a vacuum. It's public policy choices being made against the lobbying of corporations who may benefit or lose on the back of public policy choices. And I wonder what your thoughts are on, you know, whether or not there is a space for real health care reform. I agree with you that the childhood tax credit is an obvious thing we have to do. I would agree that, you know, paid family leave, universal pre-K, all of these things on which we're behind are obvious. But I do think that health care is such a profoundly important one to the everyday voter and is such a profoundly important one to thinking about the future. What do, what do you think about the potential or the movement for real reform when it comes to health care? You know, where... Uh, do we go from the position that we're at right now uh, to potentially where we need to be, where we truly do have a health care guarantee and ideally a health care guarantee that provides everybody equitable access to health care, not just access to some health care? Well, I'll take this in a, in a couple of, of bites, uh, because right in front of us right now, in addition to the childhood tax credit, we have the first ever opportunity to pass legislation which contains the negotiation of drug prices not just for Medicare and Medicaid, but for everybody. Um, That is the most popular provision in healthcare that I've ever seen. Um, It polls like 90% of the public believes that the government should be able to negotiate drug prices. 
libertarians believe we should be able to negotiate drug prices. So um, only if you work in a drug company do you think that you should be the only people on the planet that don't have to have a, um, a drug price that's reasonable. Now, we could have arguments and debates and very valid ones about rewarding innovation, uh, rewarding the kind of innovation that created the vaccines. I, I, you know, I think we're all for that. Uh, but um, you know, do, do we really need to reward um, that insulin that's 1% you know, different um, that, than, than insulin everybody else changes and be able to increase in costs by 100% every three or four years? Um, you know, that's uh, in, in the rest of our economy, we're used to things going down in price as they're on the market longer, not going up. But in, in, in with, with drug costs, which affects everybody, that's that's not the case. So I think um, it's important to, you know, you're asking a question about about something more universal and something that guarantees everybody coverage. But it's important not to lose sight of the fact that we got to make the basic things that people can't afford affordable and put a priority on that um, if we're going to if we're going to make progress. Um, you know, I think beyond that, um, I think the question is, you know, what is the political will to continue to move in that direction? Um, you and I, I think, and, and probably many people listening would have basically very high levels of agreement on what should be done. There may be ten different ways on how to get there, and on. Um, you know, different different provisions in different ways and so on and so forth. And it gets complex. But the bigger question is, how do we build the political will in this country? Um, you know, right now, uh, the people that are in favor of even the Affordable Care Act, which I think we'd all say is a partial step, are in deep danger of being voted out of office uh, in favor of people who wanted to repeal it. Um, so, um, you know, the, the political sentiment in this country um, around... Healthcare, um, and I. By the way, I know you want to narrow the question of healthcare, but the same is true about climate. The people who want to uh, reward p uh, people who create renewable energy are are in very serious danger of being voted out by people who want to keep expanding fossil fuels. Um, so, I, I don't think that we're on a realistic cusp of um, moving in the dramatic direction of of getting um, healthcare. Um, available to everybody in this country in an equitable fashion um, until such time as we decide that those things are important. They're important enough to vote for, um, and they're an important part of what we need to have. And, uh, you know, I think it's incumbent upon people running for office and people voting to keep articulating those issues and do so in a way that continues to build momentum all of the these policies around low taxes and everything else, um, the reason that they've been able to stick is because they've been run at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. They ran at the grassroots in state legislatures. They ran at the grassroots um, with with the with the Freedom Caucus and and the Tea Party, uh, and that it is far more effective to run a grassroots campaign than it is to run um, some lobbying campaign. Um, so you can overturn the will of the lobbyists if you have effective grassroots support for basic and fundamental things. Uh, but I'd put healthcare high on the list, I'd put climate high on that list, I'd put gun safety laws high on that list. All of these are things that the vast majority of the public supports, but we've not been able to convert into political victory to the degree that we should. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of those. And I, you know, I, I have some experience with um, with uh, elections and, um, you know, albeit uh, having ran once and lost once, so maybe my thoughts here aren't uh, as relevant. But I do think that in order for us to be able to build the kind of grassroots momentum that we need, we have to be dead set on doing it. And the frustration sometimes is that the party that's opposing those folks uh, who want to run against science and the consequences of science um, tends to be unclear about what we actually want. And that, that can be, um, you know, a bit frustrating. And what does win elections is clear messages. And the, one of the frustrating pieces, I think, of this moment is that, um, is that the message coming on, on, on the side of providing more people health care, uh, addressing climate change, taking on the power of the gun lobby and, uh, and, and saving lives tends to be uh, less um, concerted, less clear, and less honest about uh, the direction forward and a galvanizing message. And I think that that can be some of the big frustration 
towards your end though, right? You, you, you the, 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 Shocking thing, um, I think, to, to any of us watching the pandemic who believe in science and believe in the process of science is that the most galvanized group to come out of the pandemic uh, politically tend to be folks who want to take science out of public policy. You know, I think here in Michigan, they're trying to uh, uh, pass a, um, a, uh, a citizens committee um, to reform the public health code that was written in 1978 that gives uh, health directors basic powers uh, over public health. Um, and you can see these kinds of, of, of drives across the country. Um, the, the worry I have is that, you know, a lot of this has um, not just in the short term limited our capacity to uh, take on the pandemic by limiting um, people's belief in uh, the safe and effective vaccines, which we know work, but also have the potential to undercut public health, uh, which is a paradox considering how uh, poorly we had invested in public health in the first place. How do we take on um, the anti-science, um, you know, anti, frankly, anti-structured uh, 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 knowledge uh, approach um, that we're seeing sort of crop up in the grassroots um, among uh, or within our politics? Well, look, there, there are a number of people who have what I would consider to be a freedom fetish. Um, uh, they really um, want to have it both ways. They want to live in a country of one um, where their commitment to one another um, only goes so far as their own personal self-interest and wishes. So in a world like that, anything a government does um, that in any way restricts what they believe to be their unadulterated freedom um, is something that they, that they object to. Um, so, you know, take into the logical conclusion that's that's a society where everybody's allowed to drive drunk uh, because we live in a country of one and we can all police ourselves and the state shouldn't be um, moving uh, to, to prohibit those sorts of activities and those sorts of behaviors. We can have a debate over where the reasonable limits are and we should be respectful of people's views uh, and we should be able to have this conversation in a civil fashion. Uh, and, and both sides disrespect each other and insult each other too much, in my opinion, um, for that to happen. So, uh, like, being able to do, uh, have these very real important debates in a civil way with people we disagree with um, has, to be, has to be able to happen. Um, that's not necessarily an anti, this is not necessarily anti-science, but it's related. It's people who um, really are, um, just view anything that the government does um, as by definition uh, wrong. Now, I would say uh, that the other side of the equation is that there are, um, it has now become, um, you know, the, 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 now the most as reliable source as you can find is whatever you see next on Facebook that happens to roll up into your Twitter feed or into your Facebook feed because the algorithm suggests that you're gonna be susceptible to a message. So what you say at a school of public health, if you spend years studying something and you have authority versus what someone who has mastered the algorithms of Facebook says, you're at a distinct disadvantage. Um, it takes away um, any form of objective truth um, for uh, you to, to believe in. And look, science is not about um, finding a middle ground between two facts. As someone said to me the other day, if I say the world is flat and you say the world is round, we don't compromise and say the world is oval. Um, there, there, but, uh, but yet there are also times when scientists are uncertain. And when scientists are uncertain, I think my warning to scientists is um, not to overexpress confidence um, in the opinions you're giving, uh, but in fact to say we have uh, plenty of places where we have unsettled science and we have to learn and have mature conversations with people and tell people the truth and respect the differences where people come from. Um, is it unreasonable for people not to want the government to step in and tell them what to do? That's a very reasonable feeling. Maybe starts with acknowledging that that's a very reasonable feeling, but at the same time, um, we have to be able to explain to people how um, un their unadulterated sense of their own freedom infringes on everybody's health and safety and that should be a reasonable dialogue as well. 
Yeah, I appreciate that point uh, about misinformation. And, you know, one of the, the, the frustrations, I think, about this moment is that, you know, there, there had not been a baseline level of investment in science communication about the process of science. And the problem is, is the way that we educate science is that we almost educate uh, people to believe that science is a body of knowledge. You learn science in a book and, you know, whatever you need to know about COVID-19, you could have found in the book. And if the science has changed uh, their message, that means that they lied to us about what was in the book rather than science being a process and the process itself not having resolved to a firm and consensus outcome. And that's particularly true when you're trying to message the outcome of science in the context of unsettled science in the middle of a pandemic of a new virus that's just emerged. How, how should scientists and frankly the public be thinking about how we message science in an era of uh, dis and misinformation? How, how do scientists maybe make their work more about, about messaging the process uh, rather than the top line messaging um, and, you know, in your experience as a senior advisor to the COVID task force, uh, largely responsible for much of the public messaging, what were some of the tips that, um, that you took home from uh, what was effective and, and maybe what was not? Look, always tell the truth and always assume, pretend like you're talking to your sister. So would you take an extra two minutes to explain the nuance to your sister if she asked you a complex question? If she said, hey, do these vaccines work? Now, my sister would saying, be explaining it to me, probably, but <laughs> right, right. So, so, well, so we'll put the shoes on to your sister explaining it to you. Um, you you might say, yes, they work. You should get vaccinated, which is what we say in public. But you might also say, hey, the vaccines wane. The vaccines aren't perfect. The vaccines are just one tool. Let's keep using other tools. Those are uh, that that is nuance. It's not as soundbite or quick or easy. But it's the truth and it's the advice you'd give your own family member. And I think we always regret it if we don't try to do that. Uh, and I found it was very important to just speak bluntly and say it in as simple words as possible when I was at the Biden White House. Um, if there was something that wasn't going well, to just say it's not going well. And then to talk about what we were doing about it and how long I thought it would, think it would take to fix. If we didn't know something, um, I think it's important to say I don't know. And the other thing that's very hard for scientists to do is to say, I'm wrong. Um, and um, I will tell you that there's a lot of power in that because what scientists are used to saying is, hey, I said what I said back in January because that was the best information I had in January. Now that I know different, of course I feel differently. Well, that sounds like a lot of ivory tower babble to some people. Instead of saying, hey, you know what? I was wrong in January because I didn't know that X, Y, Z. And people, I think, can rightly accuse science and scientists and public communicators of science of, of being arrogant, of thinking they're infallible. Um, and I don't think that that, um, that creates much, much trust. And saying, look, this isn't settled, we don't know, but we're trying to protect the greatest number of people. So this is what we're saying. And this is what we think, as opposed to masquerading um, it and trying to position it with the public. The public's too smart. The press is too smart. You're never going to gain trust by trying to oversimplify things. So get the message well. Talk as if you're talking to a family member, and that level of with that level of care, that level of, of simplicity, and that level of nuance. I get questions all the time, um, as I'm sure you do, as I'm sure many of you do on the phone. And the questions are tend to run into things like, "What should I do if?" And you tend to try to answer people very carefully. Um, and I think when we talk publicly, it's no different. We should just try to answer things very, very carefully, uh, but also recognize we're playing a we're playing a, 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 a somewhat a, a, an unfair game because we're playing against misinformationists, misinformation specialists who will play dirty. Um, and so the only way to beat that is by regaining trust and establishing trust at a level of uh, where people really want to place their trust, which is the people they know locally, doctors, um, et cetera. I, um, I, I want to you know, ask you, uh, as someone who has worked uh, in, um, in the federal government now in, in two very different types of roles, one is uh, acting director of, of CMS and, and the other on the COVID task force, um, what what do we get wrong about the incentives that policymakers face in public health and health care? And, and, and really, what do we get right? And, and as, as folks engaged in uh, the, the policy 
uh, space, um, what kinds of output and, 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 and thought leadership um, is the most valuable for people in, uh, in public positions making hard decisions every day? Um, and what have you found particularly helpful, both as someone who's worked in government, but then also someone who's advised on the outside? Uh, as you called yourself uh, an outsider's insider. Um, what what is that crosstalk that's the most beneficial? And to young people who are interested in in in, in getting involved in government, what are the skill sets that they should be building right now? So it's it's really important that no matter what you're doing, whether you're in government or some other decision maker, um, you have some reliable way of connecting to the real world and the real issues, and not just hearing from one party. I mean, it's it's very easy in Washington. The people who have most access to you are the people that have big lobbying organizations. Um, so the question I would always ask my team when they made a recommendation is, who did you talk to and who did you listen to? And if you've heard from the pharmaceutical lobby and the, and the health plan lobby, I want to know what consumer groups have you talked to? Um, what hospitals have you talked to? What doctors have you talked to? Um, no one has monopoly on the truth. Uh, everybody sees things differently from their different angle. Their job is to assimilate it all and into the into the values that you, they're supposed to represent with the, the public, but really to understand what's going on. And a lot gets missed between um, well-intended policies and things that really work for people. Um, and we don't take the time to stop and ask the question, um, you know, what is it that really works for you? Um, the, so the, the number one policy concern on most people's mind, the number one is never talked about in public policy arenas. Not once do you hear it in any legislation or any bills. And the number one issue in people's minds, from a healthcare standpoint, you can all like do your silent guessing. It's support for caregivers. Support for caregivers. Support for caregivers of people of their parents who are getting old, of uh, family members, of their kids, of of other of other people. That is people's number one fear and issue and concern um, is how to take care of. Um, someone in their family as they age or get sick um, or need care or are disabled. Um, and it's, it is largely um, never talked about in the policy arena. So I, I only point this out to say that, um, like everything, um, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Seek to see understand what's going on before you say, I've got the greatest policy idea in the world. Because if your policy idea doesn't address, for example, this problem with caregivers, there's going to be a lot of people out there saying, oh, they still don't get it. They still don't get me. Um, they, they're not speaking to me. So um, I think in, in all of these roles, being able to actively listen, being able to observe, being able to hear the hard truths um, is, is, a, is a vital skill. And, you know, I think the, for younger people out there who want to consider careers in government, um, I think the new model is going to be for people who um, get to have a life and a, and a set of experiences in the public sector um, and, and maybe move in and out um, a little bit, you know, do, do some public health work, do some academic work, do some private sector work, do some government work and, and get a flavor for, um, you know, what all of that is like. And I think you, you learn that the people inside the government are just like the people um, inside uh, any organization, they're, they're very smart, they're very well-meaning, um, they have a limited set of resources, um, and you know, they need to do the best they, job they can understanding what the, the circumstances they're trying to solve are. And, um, and there's no other way to understand what their world is like than to live in their world for a couple of years. So I think if people are willing to do a, a few years in the state, federal, or local government role, um, and then go back and work on change, uh, you know, it will certainly help. I appreciate that. I uh, want to move to questions from uh, the audience. So if you have them, please do uh, make sure uh, to post them. You can also just tweet them at Policy Talks. Um, this is uh, from Twitter. Uh, it's our good friend, Kristen or Erkiza. Uh, she lost her dad to COVID on the 30th of June in 2020. And she put the blame directly on the government. And since then, she spoke at the DNC and founded the group at Marked by COVID. You can go ahead and check them out on Twitter. Um, her question ultimately is, how do we redress the loss of life and the millions of us in deep grief? Yeah, well, thank you for the, the question, Kristen. Um, I am um, at least a little bit familiar with your work. 
uh, and admire it. And I think it's exactly the, um, um, the, I think the way this question is phrased um, indicates one reality, which is there are a lot of um, unaddressed um, issues that have come out of the pandemic. And by the way, um, they don't all look alike, but they're all important. Um, many of us have lost family members. Many of us have lost friends. Uh, many of us have lost school years. Um, some people have started businesses uh, in 20, 15 years ago that was their life dream, and they closed it because of COVID. You know, those are all losses. That's all, all of this is suffering. And I think the first step is acknowledging that that the suffering and the pain that exists and that has existed and that it all doesn't look alike and it's all real. And um, until we can do that, I think it's hard to heal. Um, it's hard to move on unless we can achieve some level of understanding uh, of what's of what's there, some acknowledgement. You know, I, I often, when I, when I deal with pain and grief and suffering and loss, I try to figure out, well, eventually I come to the question, what's the productive what's the productive use of this emotion that I can try to find? Um, which is, I think exactly um, what, what, uh, what Kristen is doing here um, is what action can I take? What greater understanding can I achieve? Um, and, you know, what, what can I share with others or build with others that helps people um, to move to a place where they have um, uh, feel like their loss wasn't purposeless. Um, feels like um, that they can honor the people they lost in some way that creates some legacy that changes something about the world for other people to make it better so it's not in vain. Um, and you know, many of us who've lost parents at various points along the way um, have struggled with that very question. I think. Uh, I think that helping people understand through those stories is one step. I think deciding what action is important to take um, uh, to get to some level of, um, of I don't even want to say closure, but some level of purpose um, that, that uh, makes things better is, is really the challenge. It's really the journey. And I don't know that there's any one specific way that works for everybody. Um, but I do think that the opportunity to say to, um, to, to, to basically face off to your community and say, um, we had this loss, um, we have to learn from it, we have to make it better, is in part the healing process um, and seeing things change and seeing things different because you can never um, recover what's lost. You can only change um, what happens next? And I've always tried to say during this pandemic, whatever, whatever we've screwed up so far, the most important life is the life we have. We can save today, and save tomorrow. And if we screw up today, then we got to wake up tomorrow and save more lives because there's another 1,500 people every day that are dying from COVID. And if we didn't save the last 1,500, we need to do everything we can to save the next 1,500. Um, and it is, um, it is in that sense that I think we eventually hopefully make ourselves better. Um, I don't think these losses sadly ever completely um, heal, but, uh, but I do feel uh, certainly for her and her, her situation and I admire what she's doing. Yeah, me too. I, what I love about um, Kristen's project is, is exactly that, is that she's found in her grief an opportunity to bring other people together um, to pre prevent that kind of grief for other people. I want to move uh, to a couple other questions that we got. Um, what are the kinds of things that uh, students in particular, but but frankly, anyone uh, out there who's concerned about our particular circumstance right now, and in particular, the uh, lack of funding and support for local health departments and local health professionals, what are the kinds of things that they can do to advocate uh, and to, uh, to, to support the effort uh, to improve funding and, and, and prevent the, the next one? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the cost of um, the cost of neglect is high, and I would also say 
you know, we are going to see a number of people in public health profession and healthcare in general burning out uh, and leaving the profession in, in really large numbers. Um, and so, you know, we are starting from a position of a real challenge. And we also have, you know, if not half the country, certainly half the politicians in the country um, that come out of this pandemic convinced that public health is even less worthy than, than going in. And you said this, Abdul. Um, but there's a silver um, uh, lining here that's going to emerge. Um, the other day, um, I asked my um, niece, um, who is a rising freshman here in California at Cal Poly, um, what is she majoring in? And she said, oh, public health. And oh, so many, and I said, are, are you alone? She said, oh no, a lot, of, a lot of my friends are majoring in public health. And I think about this from, her, from the standpoint of what people have lived through, what, what younger people have gone through, and they see public health as nothing but a land of possibilities. It's how do you, and it has all these great things in it. How do you solve problems for society? How do you work on interesting issues? How do you touch healthcare if you like healthcare but hate the sight of blood, which is true for a lot of people? Like, um, it, it's a very intriguing career. Uh, and I think we need a, um, as with everything else, we need younger people. Um, who are going to energize um, around these concepts um, in addition to fighting for, um, you know, the the day-to-day -day funding, et cetera, uh, you know, that, that we need. So, look, I think there is finally more money out there to be spent. I think we need talented and creative people um, who can um, invest of themselves and invest of, in, uh, of their time uh, in, in, into this infrastructure, who know what this means, who understands uh, the great advances we make as a country uh, when we look out for one another. And, you know, at some level, this goes back a little bit to the question around Kristen, is like, we got to have some reconciliation here um, about what's going to make this world uh, a better place, uh, what's going to make this country a better place to live in, some real dialogue, which says, hey, you know what, when this, when this nurse was working 24 hour shifts, four days in a row, and we were out being careless, maybe we should just listen to that nurse now talk because she's got to deal or he's got to deal with his or her own trauma. And, and, and they've got to, um, and, the, and one of the best things we could do is listen to them. Listen to them, tell us what it was like. Honor their stories, honor them, honor what uh, they're carrying forward, help them all heal. And, um, you know, Part of that, I think, is is the path back. It's there's there's always a million reasons to be pessimistic, and there's always an equal number of reasons you could choose to be optimistic. And I'm sure we all bounce back and forth a little bit between them. But at the end of the day, if we don't choose the optimistic path, we don't build for something better, then it'll be harder to get there. I uh, I really appreciate that, and you know, the, all the folks uh, out there thinking about what they want to study. Public health is um, one of those uh, amazing outcome-oriented uh, 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 disciplines. And similar to public policy, there are there are a tremendous number of skill sets that you can bring um, in either public policy or public health that uh, that all uh, redound to a set of goals uh, to be a more just, equitable, sustainable society, and to to deal with all of the context that. Uh, shape health and well-being above the skin. And so um, whether it's public health or public pol policy, I think it's critical for folks to be thinking about this uh, in this way. And I appreciate that point, Andy. Um, th there is a, a question about, you know, which particular healthcare stakeholder, doctors, pharma, patients, insurance companies, et cetera, that have the greatest potential to play a role in solving health inequities? Uh, or is the solution more of a patchwork of improvements on all the stakeholders part? And I'll just say for my part, I believe that um, you know, people who have been leading this fight have been the nurses and the health um, healthcare uh, uh, support uh, staffers across hospitals and clinics. Um, I will say that I think it's time, high time for doctors to get in the fight in the right way. And for a long time, the AMA has been the wrong side of health reform, whether it was Medicare or uh, or it was um, the the ACA up until the very very end. And so I do think that doctors have a unique opportunity now, recognizing the changing shift in the healthcare um, space and the fact that doctors are getting nickel and dimed by large corporations to be on the right side of this fight. Andy, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, on, on that question. 
So for two years, I sat as CMS administrator, and I would take outside meetings, and um, people would come in and, and explain to me in great detail um, how um, much to blame some other party was for something going wrong in healthcare. So you know, the pharma companies would come in and lambast the insurance companies. The insurance companies would come in and blast the hospitals and the pharma companies. The hospitals would come in and blast um, the, the nurse unions and uh, and the insurance companies, uh, and 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 you know, I would always try to go at some point in the meeting. I would ask the same question. So, out of curiosity, what percentage of the blame do you get? Does your your industry get zero, one percent? Are you the ones that do everything right? Um, because you got a really clean articulation of everybody else's problems, but no, I've heard no articulation that you understand your own contribution to it. And so I'd say if you think you're not, if you think you're, it's if you think it's someone else, then you are probably the biggest problem, uh, including me. You know, I think, you know, we all have a sense of, well, I, I get it. I get it. But, you know, as we learned with, um, with structural racism, you don't have to be out there as a racist to be contributing to the misery of people who are getting discriminated against because there's structural policies you're upholding. We learn this. We're, we're learning this. We're still learning this. Many of us are going on this journey and learning learning this all the time. And the same thing is true here. Um, there is so much uh, inequity that's built into just the, the way we do things as a system. And every time uh, we make things better for one party and don't make things um, equally better or put more effort in making it better for everybody, uh, we're exacerbating the challenges. And so you know, you really have to, um, every, in any one and every one of those roles uh, that we're talking about here and every other one, if you're part of the healthcare system and you're not actively making equity a part of how you're doing your job every single day, then you're probably making inequity a part of how you do your job every single day because it is just so much harder uh, for people, as we talked about earlier, to get uh, even the basics of what they need uh, from the healthcare system. But here's the great news. Like, why not think innovatively? Why not think about how to do even better for people who have less or who are more challenged? Um, why not go out of our way? We learned this with COVID. Um, once we got it and understood how people lived, we started bringing vaccines to people's churches, to people's uh, places of work, to their homes. We started giving, getting people free Lyft and Uber rides to getting vaccine sites. Once we started thinking innovatively, we closed the gap um, pretty quickly in uh, the at the very least um, the, that that level of measurement. Um, Medicare, me, I mean, your Medicaid um, uh, expanded Medicaid uh, over the course of the five years after the program passed dramatically reduced disparities in almost every measure. Um, so everybody who participated in that should feel pretty darn good about the closure of gaps. And I'm talking maternal mortality. I'm talking infant mortality. I'm talking foreclosure rates in homes. I'm talking about uh, ability to hold on to a job. I'm talking about ability to accumulate wealth. Uh, I'm talking about cancer disparities and cardiac disparities. All of them improved. Um, now, if you are a doctor and you don't take Medicaid patients uh, because, you know, government's too much of a pain, reimbursements are too low, et cetera, that's fine. That's your right. No one's going to say it's not your right, but you are not part of the solution. And you don't deserve you don't deserve my gratitude um, for um, facing off in these challenges. Um, and so you either have to you you know you have you get to decide every day. Put it this way: you get to decide every day what you believe in based on what you do. Every single day, you get to make the call, not based on what you say, but based on your actions, based upon how you choose to do your job, based on. Uh, and I say this to my kids. When you choose to speak up in a room when everyone in the room seems to be heading a direction towards ratifying a decision that's gone and served the same people for years, and um, somebody's voice comes in the room and says, you know what, I think this decision isn't fair, or I think there's another way to think about it. If someone doesn't do that, if someone doesn't have the courage to do that, then life continues to go on. So every day we get to make that choice. It's not always easy, requires courage, um, but that's how shit changes. I appreciate that. And um, I want to finish on a final note. You, you, the, the, you are the author of a book Nick, called Preventable. And uh, our final question uh, from, a, from a viewer is, uh, 
please expand on what we can do next time to prevent this horrific chapter in our history from repeating itself. And you know, final thoughts that you have for us today. Well, look, we're not always going to prevent the vaccine from coming. The, I'm sorry, the virus from coming to our shores. Um, we're we're we are going to um, have overwhelming viruses, and by the way, not just viruses, but other threats, bacteria, climate change, um, things that antibiotics uh, are resistant towards. Um, so we need to uh, understand that in those situations, those situations occur. Um, uh, it really is going to be um, critical, not that we just have a better technical response or a better better political leadership. God willing, we'll have better political leadership um, that is honest with the public and so forth. But that we recognize that unless we have a commitment to one another, even people we've never met before, unless I care about your family, Abdul, who I don't know, unless you care about mine, uh, then, you know, we don't actually have as great a chance of getting through this without lower loss of life. And if you look at societies that have um, much more commonality, where income levels are closer, where people live more similar lives, you look at, again, this would be East Asia, this would be um, Africa, Scandinavian countries, others, when there is more of a bond and less wealth disparity, those, those countries have shown more support for one another in getting through the pandemic. If you look at countries with great extremes of wealth and poverty, like India, Russia, Brazil, the United States, um, they do less good. And it's people at the bottom end that, that suffer disproportionately. So, you know, I, I think there's lots we can do better technically to prevent this from happening. We can elect better leaders. But at the end of the day, uh, honestly, we just got to be better people. Um, and and I don't mean that to, to make that sound as judgmental as it sounds, but we, we just have to be um, willing to take, to do even slight, make even slight sacrifices for one another. And if we know that other people's lives who we've never met are at stake, uh, I think we're more likely to do that. Andy, I think that's a great place to, uh, to wrap it up. I want to thank you uh, for your work and your service, as well as your book, and, and for taking the time to uh, join us here today. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all of the good folks at the Ford School, Aaron Flores and, and Daniel Rifkin, for uh, their um, uh, incredible work in putting this together. I want to thank all of you for taking the time uh, to engage in this conversation, to offer your questions, and, uh, and to offer an opening ear. And uh, you know, on a final note, on, on my end, I just want to say that um, I do believe that we have the opportunity to, to build uh, from where we are right now. And I do think that in this moment, it does feel like there are so many forces pushing back. But I've seen, you know, in my time at the Ford School and my time um, uh, running for office and before that, that the most powerful force in American public life uh, is the passion and, and the commitment of young people. And um, I do hope that uh, there's been something in the conversation that we shared today that inspires you and, and gives you that passion. Uh, and I hope that we can continue to walk a path together toward building the kind of uh, America where something like this um, does not happen. And if it does, uh, where the consequences are not so inequitable um, and fall uh, hardest on the backs of people for whom our oppression, unfortunately, uh, has already done so much damage. So with that, um, really, really appreciate you joining us, Andy. I really appreciate everyone uh, in attendance. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your day.